14 and 16 inch displays, mini LED displays, M1X Apple Silicon, two efficiency cores, eight performance cores, up to 32 graphics cores, up to 64 gigabytes of RAM, eight terabytes of SSD, maybe, probably no touch bars, but MagSafe, HDMI, and SD cards. I'm Renee Ritchie, thanks to CuriosityStream with Nebula for sponsoring, and yes, I hear you, I feel you. We've been waiting for the Apple Silicon MacBooks Pro for so long now. Ever since the moment Tim Cook announced the transition back in June of 2020, and as the first ultra low power Macs just transformed and rolled out from November to April, we've been waiting for the ultra high performance Macs, the Pros. We didn't get them last June, but it's increasingly looking just better than ever that we'll get them late October, early November, this fall. So right now I'm gonna go through all the most recent reports and not just recapitulate or regurgitate them, but dive into all the little details about what these new MacBooks actually really mean for pros. So hit subscribe and let's go. The ultra low power M1 MacBook Air, entry level MacBook Pro and Mac mini from last November all stuck with their original Intel inside designs. The M1 iMac from back in April though, that went as all new as it did all colorful, adopting the same great flattening design language that Apple kicked off with the 2018 iPad Pro. And now it sounds like Apple's ready to bring that flat straight back to the Mac, to the MacBooks Pro, which should mean the same basic round rect shape and squared off edges but just none of the curves on the bottom or the top. And if that's true, it would look absolutely fantastic and be incredibly consistent with all of Apple's other high-end products. But since it doesn't sound like the new MacBooks Pro will be any thicker, that might leave less space for a camera inside the lid and yeah, battery inside the base, which, more on both of those things in a bigger on the inside minute. Now, Apple did already Thanos snap the bezels on the bigger MacBook Pro when they took them from 15 inches to 16 inches back at the end of 2019. Now they just have to do the exact same thing for the smaller MacBook Pro as well, blip it from 13 inches to a more chassis filling 14. And that should really maximize the portability but also the productivity as well, especially if reports from Steve Moser and Mac rumors pan out and the resolution really is bumped up to 3456 by 2234 for the 16 inch and 3024 by 1964 for the 14 inch, which sure just wouldn't be native 4K, but at 250 PPI would be native at 2X retina at long last. And that would make pixel peepers just so much happier than the current scaled down defaults. TFI international security analyst Guo Mingqi, among others, have also reported that these displays should be going to mini LED, just like the 12.9 inch iPad Pro did back in April. And hopefully for both models, not just the bigger version like Apple did with the iPad Pro. Now, mini LED offers a high dynamic range experience, HDR, almost on par with OLED, but without some of the drawbacks that have traditionally plagued OLED on larger size screens, especially at Apple level higher production volumes. That's like off axis color shifting, which makes them look overly blue from an angle, pulse width modulation at low brightness levels, which some people say that they can see and that bothers them, and inconsistent peak brightness levels, which can make large areas of white look splotchy. Now Apple's current mini LED implementation has a much higher peak brightness in their current OLED implementation. And that might just be, you know, iPads versus iPhones, but it's 1600 to 1200. And because mini LED uses local dimming zones and isn't self illuminating like OLED, it does suffer from blooming, which is like a halo around bright highlights on very dark backgrounds. But overall, I think mini LED is still a far, far better choice for laptops and tablet sized displays at least sold at Apple scale, and at least for now. So to me, the bigger question is 120 Hertz adaptive refresh because the current 16 inch MacBook Pro, yeah, it can be manually toggled between 48 Hertz and 60 Hertz. So you can better edit 24 frames per second movies versus 30 frames per second TV shows. But adaptive refresh on the iPad Pro 
can go all the way down to 24 hertz for static images and all the way up to 120 hertz for scrolling and gaming, which not only provides for a much better experience, but for much better power efficiency. And I haven't seen, I haven't seen any specific rumors suggesting 120 hertz is coming to the MacBooks Pro at least anytime soon, but it's increasingly showing up on Windows devices and I want it, an Apple nerd can dream. Now, there was a report from Dylan DKT on Twitter that Apple will be including a version of their new 1080p webcam just above those new displays, similar if not the same to the one they introduced with the M1 iMax last spring, and those are aces. It's kind of hard to see how a deeper camera would fit into an even flatter MacBook Pro lid, unless that lid is flatter thicker and not flatter thinner. So take this one with a camera bump sized grain of salt for now. But you know what? I would take a camera bump at this point, even a notch to just give me, to give us a good webcam. But let me know how you feel in the comments. When it comes to ports, the entry level M1 MacBook Pro stuck to the two USB-C Thunderbolt 3 setup, now just called USB 4, that Apple introduced back in 2016 when they ditched the old HDMI, SD card reader, and MagSafe. But according to Guomingqi, everything old will be new again with the M1X MacBooks Pro, like CSI Las Vegas, I guess, with the return of those HDMI, SD card readers, and MagSafe-ish. Also, maybe, hopefully, Ethernet in the power brick like the M1 iMac introduced, because I would all caps love that. Now, HDMI could be 2.0, like the M1 Mac Mini, which offers up to like 18 gigabits per second of bandwidth, or it could be 2.1, like the A12 Apple TV, which offers up to 48 gigabits per second, and that translates to higher resolutions like 8K, better frame rates like 120 frames per second, and even more dynamic HDR. But whether Apple thinks that's as critical for a MacBook, even a MacBook Pro, as it is for TV, we'll just have to wait and see. Now, SD should be SDXC UHS 2, like the 2020 Intel iMac, and MagSafe, well, Apple probably wouldn't call it MagSafe because that name has now been conquested by the new iPhone magnetic inductive charging system. So it'll probably just be called a magnetic power connector, like on the back of the M1 iMac, only much, much smaller, like USB-C size smaller, so it can fit on the side of a MacBook Pro, which really kind of leaves me to wonder just how many USB 4 ports, the USB-C Thunderbolt 3, or hopefully Thunderbolt 4 hybrid ports, we're actually gonna get to keep. Because as much as some people love the idea of the return of the HDMI and SD card awakens, because it'll let them live a dongle-free, or at least dongle-free or life, it will cut both ways. Right now, the higher-end MacBook Pros have four USB-C slash Thunderbolt 3 ports that we can plug into on either side or turn into any other port with a dongle, yes, but at any time and on either side, including HDMI and SD, even on both sides. But once those become fixed ports in time and space, like Evil Doctor Strange or Amy Pond, there's just no going back. We won't be able to plug SSDs into HDMI or power into the SD card slot. And if you want power or HDMI on the opposite side, because that's how long the TV cable is, or that's where the plug is situated in the coffee shop, you'll still have to dongle up anyway, and then you're wasting one of the few remaining USB-C ports to do it. Never mind idiots like me who don't even use SD cards anymore, but CF Express cards, so we'll still need those dongle readers, even as the built-in slot just sits there wasting space, naked and alone, laughing at us, like the Troy Baker Joker. Now, don't get me wrong, because it will make life super easy for prosumers, but it'll be a bear of an inconvenience for hardcore pros who know there's really no such thing as a dongle-free life. So two USB 4 at worst on the 14 inch, maybe three at best on the 16 inch. Let me know not only what you think, but which of these multiverses you'd prefer. Same with the touch bar, which Mark Gurman from Bloomberg says Apple might just get around to deleting this time. And personally, I'd be okay with that because I do use it for scrubbing through tabs and timelines and easily finding previously buried and obscure menu items. But since Apple introduced it in 2016, they've done precisely almost nothing to improve it. There's no haptics, no taptics, no textures, no nothing. And I thought at the beginning it would have a ton of potential but I never wanna become more invested in something, in a product and a feature, than the company that makes it. So if nature has selected the touch bar for extinction, so be it, like dinosaurs or YouTube Rewind. Of course, 
What really truly excites all the high order bit nerds the most is the chipset that'll be powering these new MacBooks Pro, which by most recent reports and based on Apple's previous patterns will be an M1X or massively extended version of the M1. Now, M1 was based on A14, the iPhone 12 system on a chip. And since then, Apple has shipped A15, the iPhone 13 system on a chip, which is what I'd expect M2 to be based on and the next generation of ultra low power Macs like the next MacBook Air. But that raises the question, now that A15 has shipped, will the MacBooks Pro get M1X or M2X and would there really be any difference? And I've done a couple deep dives on that already, which I'll link to in the description below the like button, but TLDW, previous reports suggested Apple was targeting these new MacBooks Pro for June, but mini LED constraints just pushed that timeline into the fall. And if that's true, then M1X makes the most sense since we only just got A15 in September. But if not, and Apple was always targeting this fall, then maybe they were always targeting M2X as well. But those are actually artificial distinctions. They're just marketing names. And Apple could include IP from both A14 and A15 generation silicon in M1X, or M1X could have even inspired some of the features in the A15. It could be a hybrid, it could be anything that Apple wants it to be, and they could call it anything they wanna call it because that is the whole entire point of controlling their own silicon destiny. And microarchitecture aside, while the A15 Avalanche high performance cores would broadly be similar to the A14 and M1 Firestorm performance cores in the bigger MacBook Pro thermal envelope, the A15 Blizzard efficiency cores are over 30% faster than the A14 and M1 Ice Storm efficiency cores. And that could make for more of a difference, especially if Mark Gurman's report on Apple going with two E cores and eight P cores for the M1X turns out to be accurate because that would be two less E cores, but four more P cores than the M1. And what that means for battery life, we'll just have to wait and see because these are meant to be ultra high performance Macs, not ultra low power Macs like the M1. But Apple's also introducing low power mode into Mac OS Monterey. And there's some evidence to suggest there'll be a high performance mode as well. So maybe Apple is once again gonna be using big compute to just push the bits way further than the atoms themselves would allow. Likewise, the A15 graphics cores are more performant than the A14 graphics cores in the M1, but either way, Mark's reporting 16 to 32 of them. And whether that's 16 for the smaller MacBook Pro and 32 for the bigger one, or options for both in both, we'll have to wait and see. But either way, it will mean just way, way more cores to throw at just everything and anything GPU bound. A15 also has faster neural engine cores than A14 and M1, but a lot of that is geared towards the camera features like cinematic mode on the iPhone 13. In the MacBook Pro, depending on how many of which cores, we could see huge leaps in everything from Core ML to AI-based photo filters, including, yeah, <laughs> super res zoom, but also deep fake Luke Skywalker, all the things. What's got me personally though, the most excited is the idea of ProRes accelerators, like the ones on the A15, because just over two years ago, Apple was introducing giant reprogrammable ASIC afterburner cards to handle exactly that on the Mac Pro. And now as of last month, those are hardware accelerated right on the A15. I mean, time flies, but silicon absolutely slaps. And I've long been saying that Apple Silicon Macs are gonna be afterburner boxes, but I can't wait to actually see it because along with way lower power draw and heat and way longer battery life, it's custom IP developed in tight integration with hardware and software teams to deliver very specific ultra high performance features that are most gonna differentiate Apple Silicon and just disrupt the old hot core centric, really, really cringe marketing of Intel. Especially if we get the suspected RAM and SSD boost as well with up to 32, maybe even 64 gigabytes of unified memory on the M1X package and hopefully the same up to four terabytes and eight terabyte options for storage for the 14 inch and 16 inch respectively, because Apple would be an absolute daisy if they do. And for way, way more on Apple Silicon, check out my A15 deep dive video, or better yet, the extended version, ad free, sponsor free on Nebula. And you can get Nebula bundled in for free when you subscribe to today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Richie, or click the link below. That's right, because you're watching this video, both CuriosityStream and Nebula together 
for 26% off, less than 15 bucks a year, less than the price of a dongle for the whole entire year. And that includes all of CuriosityStream's thousands of amazing documentaries and series like Beyond Spotlight, where after talking with Shaquille O'Neal and Samuel L. and Latanya R. Jackson, this week they feature the one and only LeVar Burton. And that's along with Nebula, we not only get my videos ad-free, sponsor-free, and bundled in for free, but MKBHD, iPhone Doe, Georgia Dow, Jordan Harrod, Low Spec Gamer, Jenny Ma, Ali Abdal, Tech Alter, and so many more, including exclusive Nebula originals you just can't get anywhere else. It's the absolute best way to support educational creators directly and the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 26% off CuriosityStream, less than 15 bucks a year, and Nebula bundled in for free. Just go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie or click the button right on the screen. Clicking really helps out the channel and so does hitting up this playlist where I explain everything about all the upcoming M1X, M2, and maybe even M2X Max. Just hit it up and I'll see you in the next video.